Coming up, we're visiting with the Cheyenne and Arapaho scholar who has been honored with the National Humanities Medal, plus Indigenous representation on a forever stamp. We hear from Clinkett and Athabascan artist Crystal Rural. I'm Malia Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. Hopa. Thank you for joining us. We start our newscast in Washington, D.C., where indigenous leaders are fresh off of laying out their priorities for this year's Farm Bill. At a U.S. Senate hearing last week, they lobbied for expanding tribal jurisdiction over programs at the Department of Agriculture. That authority would fall under Public Law 93638, which provides tribes with the power to manage federal programs that benefit their communities. More recently, 638 has been applied to native nutrition and wildfire management through USDA programs created in the 2018 Farm Bill. Senator Brian Schatz of Hawaii says the 2018 Farm Bill was the first where native communities had a, quote, meaningful seat at the table. And I think what, one of the things that we want to change over time is just to open up a little aperture here to say these are not native people with their handouts, please help us. But we actually already know what we're doing, and would you let us unleash our creativity, our knowledge, our collective wisdom, and our work ethic? And I the nearly half a trillion dollar bill is renewed around every five years and includes a large array of programs around the U.S. in agriculture and food. The Indian Gaming Association's annual conference kicked off Monday in San Diego, California. Here's ICT's Quindrea Yazi with more. Small talk, handshakes, and laughter filled the air as attendees stood in line for their badges at the 37th annual Indian Gaming Association's trade show and convention. Walking through the convention conference halls, attendees are surrounded by natural light and a beautiful view of San Diego. Victor Rocha, founder of Pachanga.net, called the gathering lively and said he was ready to be back. This gathering comes on the heels of a name change. The organization was previously known as the National Indian Gaming Association before it changed its name to the Indian Gaming Association last year. Despite the change, there are new attendees each year. I will be sitting in. Um, it would be, again, my first show, so it would be nice to see all the networking around and what I can contribute myself to. IGA is a huge event for gaming tribes. John Adev Osiela Shaudhuri, former chairman of National Indian Gaming Commission, weighed in. Tribes have always supported each other through sharing of information through sharing of resources, through having unified strategies. And IGA uh, is one of the main conferences every year that tribal leaders attend, but also uh, gaming officials and gaming operators to share information. And you share information, you identify opportunities for Indian country, whether it's economic or political. Shadari says IGA is not just about gaming, but a great opportunity to talk about tribal sovereignty and what is affecting tribes currently. But, so I'm excited about talking about opportunities, but there are also threats, uh, and those threats include the courts right now looking at the heart of what tribal sovereignty is and uh, a lot of things being up in the air as, as different cases are bubbling up through 
the court system. And it's important that the Indian gaming industry be vigilant about it, but also tribal nations as a whole. We all need to be vigilant about these things. So what excites me the most is comparing notes and developing strategies together. In San Diego, California, Quindrea Yazi, ICT News. Traction is being gained on a Canadian license plate aimed at bringing awareness to the crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous relatives. It's estimated as many as 4,000 Indigenous women and girls have been killed in Canada in the past 30 years. Now lawmakers have created a specialty license plate to raise funds for the families of those affected. Manitoba Public Insurance is in charge of the project and has partnered with the Manitoba government to see it through. The corporation manages motor vehicle safety, auto insurance and licensing. MPI is currently in consultation phases and says it is surveying the public on three different designs. The corporation is also deciding which MMIW charity will receive profits from each license plate sale. It is too soon to know the cost of the license plate, but officials say it should be available later this year. In Australia, the National Indigenous Space Academy is inspiring hope for the country's first Indigenous astronaut. The NISA initiative is a pathway for Indigenous students studying STEM to participate in programs at NASA. The Academy will provide students with learning and research opportunities in space robotics. The, this initiative is created and led by Professor Christopher Lawrence, who says he wants to see Indigenous Australians in space. To create the Academy, the Indigenous professor worked with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the Australian Space Agency. The Academy will support five students who will travel to California for a 10-week full-time summer internship. Students will learn about aerodynamics and robotics and about past and current space exploration missions. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. The United States Postal Service has unveiled its latest forever stamps. The Art of the Skateboard Collection includes designs from two indigenous artists who were also former skateboarders. Crystal Whirl uses her Clinket and Athabascan heritage and her artistry, transforming cultural art styles in a modern and contemporary approach. ICT's Mackenzie Allen Charmley spoke with her before the unveiling. Hi, Crystal, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. To start, how did you get involved with this project? Uh, USPS, um, I'm not sure how they found out about me. My assumption is that uh, I'm siblings with Rico World, who did the Raven Story stamp with them uh, the previous year. It just retired, the design did. Um, but they reached out to me and they asked if I wanted to do a design on a skateboard which then would be photographed and made into a stamp um, and I said absolutely of course um, yeah your design includes elements from your Athabascan and Clinket heritage but I was wondering how exactly or what inspired you to come up with your final design so the final design is of a sockeye salmon and I am from the Fukuhadi clan which is the sockeye salmon uh, Raven clan. Um, it's not my clan crest, but it is a image in form line design, which is Northwest Coast uh, indigenous art. So it's a sockeye salmon in form line design. And um, basically, when I get a contract with someone like USPS, I offer them a series of sketches. I ask them to go through my portfolio and tell me exactly what do you like of my work because I can do many of things. Um, what do you envision this project looking like? And so USPS sent me a mood board and from there I sent them a series of sketches uh, from which we selected their top two favorites. Um, and then those two sketches, I'll refine them and send it back and forth uh, with their board and what they want. Um, and they really seem to enjoy the water element and the salmon because um, I had a couple other designs that were like humanoid figures, um, some just form line, like very abstract imagery um, and patterns. 
but they were really drawn to the water element. Um, and maybe that's that's my strong suit being, um, you know, a, a salmon myself. So I was really stoked to that they picked that one. And from there, I vectored the design and uh, sent them the digitized image in a different series of color palettes. Um, and then from there, they ended up selecting more of the indigos and blues. Um, and it turned out really, really nice. Once we finalized the art piece, I used that design and I put it onto the skateboard and hand painted it and shipped it back to them um, to be photographed and applied to the stamp. I was hoping you could touch more on your use of form line, this artistic style of form line. For a non-artist out there, what exactly is form line and how do you use it in this modern day contemporary style, but still connecting it back to um, indigenous cultures? When I talk about form line design, it's a design that was created by uh, my ancestors. It is Pacific Northwest Coast specific um, to the tribes Clinket, Haida, and Simshian. Um, and on my Clinket side is uh, where I practice a lot of the recreation and modernization of uh, form line designs that I study from the masters. So I look at old bent wood boxes, chilcat robes, totem poles, canoes, um, and items that uh, clan members have created or previous ancestors before me created. Um, a lot of them are in museums and um, not exactly right, rightfully so, but there some of them are being repatriated and brought back home, which is really awesome. Um, baby steps. <laughs> but form line design is, um, it's been developed, you know, uh, it hasn't been the same since the beginning. It's, you know, people say it's is abstract, um, it, it is abstract design, but it's the nature of, um, you know, when I design something, these are animals and beings that I interact with, with my family. Like the salmon, we go out and go fishing every summer to collect fish. Um, and that's, that's a very Alaskan thing to do. A lot of, most families, especially Alaskan native families talk about smoking fish and hanging fish. Um, you know, who can fillet really nice. Those are all like really nice skills to have in Alaska. Um, so yeah, form line is this beautiful way of depicting our relationship to the land and the animals. And it and uh, most importantly stems from how we identify who we are. Like my clan crest, uh, if you look at my clan crest, it's a form line sockeye salmon that's arching. Um, and if you look at it, someone who knows and understands that design could know who my family is, where I'm from, what their clan's history is with my clan. Um, it just, it's an insight a lot to a history and identity and belonging. Um, just by looking at an individual's like regalia, you can see that. Could you talk about the significance of Americans buying your stamp and what representation that brings? Yeah, I mean, it's, Nowadays, everyone's on their phones and looking at their screens all the time. It's just really easy to send grandma a text. Um, but I think it's really neat to have a design on a stamp that's going to be the symbol of um, transporting messages the old way or the original way. You know, when people write a letter, at least I do, I think a lot more about my spelling, my grammar, you know, like the shape of my writing, does it look pretty? <laughs> Am I in the right mood to write this letter? Um, there's a lot more thought and intention put into handwritten letters and mails and packaging. Um, and I do a lot of packaging when it comes to shipping my artwork uh, globally or shipping it to a gallery or shipping it to a relative or as a gift. Um, I need postage to deliver uh, my work. Uh, for the, not just me connecting with my community and me paying my bills and surviving, but it's also like I need it to deliver my artwork and make a living. Um, my 
my career launching has been expanding outside of my home, um, but always coming back to it. So yeah, it's really neat. I also, um, you know, to have indigenous design on a nationally recognized currency, uh, US, uh, the US stamp is technically a currency. Um, and so it's, I think it's really important because it really changes the narrative of putting um, our storytelling back into our hands as Native people. Um, it's really important that this uh, allowing Indigenous people to tell our own story and to be the artists. What advice would you give aspiring Indigenous artists um, who are also trying to put their work out in similar ways as you? Don't be afraid, be assertive, um, be aggressive when you need to be, um, be giving when you need to be, and always, always be humble um, because there's, uh, yeah, I think being humble goes a long ways. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a lonely road. <laughs> it's a very lonely road, but um, it's also incredibly rewarding and you get to really know yourself and you get to really meet other incredible artists. Well, Crystal World, thank you for joining us. For dedicating her life to strengthening and developing Native American education, Henrietta Mann received the National Humanities Medal from President Joe Biden. Her pioneering efforts led programs and institutions across the country to develop Native American history and culture studies, honoring the ancestors that came before and benefiting generations that follow. We have a big treat today in being joined by Professor Henrietta Mann. Thank you so much, and I appreciate your inviting me to be on your wonderful show. Only 12 people are selected each year to receive this honor. Uh, tell us about the event in which uh, you got to go to the White House. Oh my gosh, I could not believe that this little Cheyenne Indian girl from Hammond, Oklahoma, population 700, was sitting in this room populated by stars such as Bruce Springsteen, um, and I understand that Elton John is in our class, although he received his medal in December or so. But it was just absolutely a parade of stars, and I was just nothing but this little land-based person. And, of course, we look upon our land as sacred. We just sat and watched them parade, and I thought, got to be this person. I'd love to have that autograph from her. I minded my manners. <laughs> we saw shortly after you got the medal from the president that you whispered something into his ear. What did you say to him? <laughs> it was crazy. I had told him when he was putting the medal over my head, don't you dare knock my glasses off my face. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we were still giggling for that, but I, I, it, was, it was just such a pressure point in my life. Can you imagine that an 88-year-old can forget what she said to the president of the United States of America? <laughs> Star struck with him, too. I touched him, and uh, he's real, and he's much more personable on a one-to-one -one level than he comes across on television. You've taught at the University of Montana, and you led the Native American Studies program. What inspired you to become an educator? This is a long story, Aaliyah, but when I was about the age of eight or nine, I encountered my first uh, episode of discrimination. And I was just horrified at the way that the Anglo teacher and some of the uh, parents of, of, of our classmates treated uh, us as Cheyenne children. I rode the bus home about three miles to the taunts of dirty Indian, lazy Indian, dumb Indian, and those kinds of things that existed and unfortunately still exist in today's America. My grandfather met me at the bus stop because he could hear me crying. And so he talked to me as only an elder could. And I decided then and there, and I was about, I think I was in the third or fourth grade, and I decided that I was going to go and work and be educated 
and be in a place where those Anglo teachers were. And I would be able to teach Indian students and I would love them and I would honor them and I would treat them as sacred little human beings. So that has been a goal of mine from childhood. And it is something that I worked very hard to attain as I grew up and got my education and um, went into the teaching profession. What an honor for me to be in the presence of our future on a daily basis and to shape their minds and give them alternative ways of looking at the world. The world that is Irish, that we first inhabited, that really produces good human beings. Aside from actually being in the classroom, you've also been on the policy side of things. You were the first woman to direct Indian education programs at the Bureau of Indian Affairs. At that time, what kinds of challenges did you face? <laughs> I had always told my students, if you're going to make changes, then you make it from within. And I had the opportunity to say no or yes to becoming uh, the director of the Office of Indian Education Program. Uh, there was a female before me, but she was not Indian. And so I stayed there a year. But unfortunately, I saw the uh, kind of immovable position that federal administrative people can be and offices can be. And I gave one year of my life to try and to change that. But again, helping uh, the 180 or so uh, elementary and secondary schools for which the Bureau of Indian Affairs was responsible. It still has that same responsibility today. But it's a dream come true to be able to begin to change, hopefully from my point of view, the kind of education and the kind of educational treatment that our beloved children, the first generation of uh, this land, should be getting that they did not need to be assimilated, they did not need to be acculturated. In fact, the curriculum had to be expanded to include a study of this land's first peoples and its history. Let's actually talk a, more, a little bit more about that. Um, I'd love to talk about the changes that you've seen in college curriculums. Uh, what makes you smile and what makes you wish that there was more progress? Oh. I graduated with my master's degree from Oklahoma State University and the employment office called me in one day and said, we think that you might be interested in this job. And it was an advertisement for faculty members to join the Native American Studies Program at San Francisco State College. I called there, of all people, I talked to uh, some of the leaders in the activist movement and I was told that UC Berkeley was hiring and that maybe I should call there because they were out on the run. They were out of Alcatraz. And so I did call Berkeley, uh, talk to the people there, was interviewed, was, and eventually was offered a job. And I went to uh, the, the San Francisco Bay Area in 1970 and walked in such a wonderful place. However, when I walked into my classroom, the Indian students were not there. I went back and inquired, you know, this is why I decided to teach in uh, American Indian Studies. Where are the Indian students? Well, they were out on the rock. They were out on the Alcatraz. They were wanting to, to have that piece of land returned to uh, indigenous peoples. They wanted to build an all Indian university of the plains, and they wanted to the ships that entered San Francisco Bay to see Indian land first. And so they began, the, the occupiers began coming back to school, enrolled in classes, and it was really in the heyday of activism. And Native American Studies was one of uh, four programs in the Department of Ethnic Studies. And for the first time in our lives, at least in the higher education level, we could teach about who we are how we view the world, what our history has been with its sadness and, and its happiness. We could teach the kinds of wisdom and knowledge handed down through the generations. We could reinforce our identities, as, as I hope that the students did, and I think they did, as this land's first and beloved peoples. It was an experience 
experience. It may be an experiment initially to begin to institute the study of this nation's first peoples in the academic curriculum of institutions of higher education. It was a joy, it was a huge responsibility, and it's one that I traveled and worked in for some four decades. Professor Mann, we're running out of time here, but I'm wondering if you have your medal there with you, and if so, if we can see it. Oh, unfortunately, it is not here, and it's still in the box, in which I, it was packed for traveling. I promise, maybe I can send you a photo of it. Maybe, Mon, maybe I'll get you one. The next time you interview me, I will wear the medal. I wear it here. It's for all of you. It was presented to me. But it's for all Indigenous Americans, especially those young people that I talk. Well, uh, National Humanities Medalist Henrietta Mann, I get to interview a ton of people um, across Indian country every day, and I have to say that this is a real honor for me, and uh, I congratulate you once again. Thank you, Aaliyah. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.